<laughs> All right. I have recorded this simple short video more times than I, I, I care to figure, and I just got it right, and the audio is stuffed up. So let's try this again. <laughs> Okay, DOS. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to leave this bit in because I think it's important for people to see the creative process isn't this clean cut. Sometimes it's just really frustrating. But anyway, moving on. DOS versus DDoS. It is one of the most misinterpreted bug classes, you know, honestly, across security. Often people talk about a DDoS as DOS. And so let's break apart the verbiage. DOS is denial of service and DDoS is distributed denial of service. So when a DOS can't be performed off a single action or a single request, it's distributed in nature. A couple of key examples there that I think often get misinterpreted as being impactful, which really aren't, XML RPC. I mean, XML RPC requires a large distribution. Its impacts are largely nullified these days. It just doesn't, it's not a P2. And then another one, SSL renegotiation. And this one's changed over time. I mean, SSL renegotiation, even in Amazon EOBs, it's turned on by default because it just doesn't have the impact that it once did with the way the internet has grown. And I'm sure I'm not completely on base with my knowledge there. I know there's gaps in my knowledge there, but for the large part, it's informational. It's not P2. And so what is a proper DOS? What's a denial of service you can actively look at? And what should you be thinking if you want to hunt DOS? So let's, let's build a scenario. Let's assume you have a site where your users, when you log in, five invalid attempts, it locks the accounts and it doesn't unlock them. It's a manual process on the company side. Somewhat, somewhat common, I think less common today than it used to be, but it comes up. Now let's assume you also discover that you can enumerate all usernames. You can then write an exploit saying, just demonstrating, you don't have to run it because you could be in a production environment. You could hard code a couple of users to prove the intention, but the user, the exploit's essence could be to brute force five times or six times rather the password of all of those accounts, thereby knocking or uh, locking all of those accounts so they can't function. You've now denied service to all of those users under the assumption they can't just send a unlock request to their email, so on and so forth. And so if that was put in a cron job or something like that, it's got impact. So you can report around that at the P2 level, taking what were two lower P4 type vulnerabilities and chaining them upwards. And that's where a lot of impact in DOS tends to rely on today is business logic and business functionality. What can be done within the business logic you have available to you that could deny a user access to the application. That's what a denial of service is at an application level. And it's often a valid finding. Whereas, you know, there are other misinterpretations of this. For example, sometimes what people think is application layer DOS is actually self DOS. So an example of that could be, you know, you send 200 characters on a certain pass. Let's say, let's say the password field, you send 500 characters to the password. The server takes 20 seconds to respond back. And you take the assumption that that impacts all users. So you report it. That's sometimes that where as people are starting out, you know, I, I can understand the thought process. You've seen it come back and you're still learning how web sessions and things work. And so it looks valid. But the important thing to remember there is in the vast, vast, vast majority of those length cases, you're only impacting on your session. And unless you can chain it in a way that it's stored so other users could perform the same action, then you've got self DOS. It's not got an impact to the user base because it is just impacting on your user. It's one of those interesting ones where that could be a valid finding, but you need to test it safely if it's in a distributed fashion. If you've got a dev set up and you've got a long string and you want to test it, the way to do this would be to test over two connections. So you could do that by using the down for everyone or just me service. So you send your long password request, you go to down for everyone, it'll run an independent request. It'll tell you if it's down. Or the way I prefer to do it, the way I think that is most reliable and the way we do it in triage is to spin up two connections. So you could send the request from one connection, test what happens. If you've got that slow response, you then send the request from another connection. And if that's not happening quick enough, say you've made a smaller throttle limit, you can just run that in an interlace loop or a bash loop and just see if it actually drops out. In most cases, you'll find it doesn't. And, you know, the caveat that because this is a bit of a harder bug class to verify, if you're still at the point of understanding the difference between DOS and DDoS, 
you're probably not going to get as much value hunting out of this because you still at that point in your journey and it is a broad assumption but you should be really focusing on learning application flow application logic where is the application possibilities for creating a denial of service condition a lot of the time there's a tendency to go okay there's these cves and these impacts so wp scripts xml rpc ssl renegotiation they're all things that aren't going to land you bug bounties and unfortunately there's been a lot of advice to the counter of that from people who made assumptions and didn't actually go and hunt that themselves and, and test the theory you need to be very cautious following advice for this kind of vulnerability class because it is so poorly misrepresented at present and it's why it's the first one i'm covering in commonly misunderstood bug classes always be cautious with advice to make sure that there's a true impact because real bug hunting and real value in bug hunting comes into application logic it doesn't tend to come bottled up in go and test for this and there's that there are definitely those situations but they're rarer and they are often found quickly if it's if something is a p2 for it to exist for example in a public target eight years after the bounty launch it's pretty unlikely and so you should always take that into consideration when you're hunting and try and hunt at the application layer because that's where things have also likely changed over those eight years more frequently than the infrastructure layer will have so all of that aside if there's other classes that you'd like me to cover please come hit me up on twitter i would love to any and all questions or things that you feel challenged by i'm watching uh this quite actively for ideas these are quicker videos for me to do they're good fill in the gap videos around when i'm working on larger projects such as interlace axiom and things like that and i'm going to be on twitch soon very very open to these kind of questions feel free to put me on the nose and ask me some harder ones if you'd like uh, my plan is to address those as they come up and you know, I, I consider myself as much of an open book as I can be within the confines of my role. I can't talk about things that are queue sensitive. So if you said, hey, is so-and-so vulnerable to subdomain takeover? I'm not going to be able to answer it because that's private information. But if you said, you know, how is a subdomain takeover in a high case different to a low case? I'll answer that as much as I possibly can. So we'd love to see you on Twitch and I'd love to see you on Twitter. Let's, let's keep the conversation rolling. I really want to interact as much as I possibly can.